what do you think some of the names are that were spoken about Mary and about Joseph and their community? I don't know if these words ever were spoken in your house or in your community, but they certainly were spoken in my house. Words like illegitimate, as if any child is not the same. Spoken of women, especially negative slang words for teenagers from high school girls who were with child. Did you think this cute little Christmas story didn't have some neighbors who were speaking to the other men? I think it had a little bit of time. Because people are people. We can judge others so that we don't need to look at ourselves. But this underlines, I believe, part of the embarrassment and part of the story as we encounter it. As we open up Matthew's account, it says now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, he was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. It's this particular aspect of the Christmas story that amongst the Christian faith is perhaps some of the most difficult for people who do not have faith to grasp. How can you believe? How can you dare to believe that this myth about Mary having a child of the Holy Spirit is true? Tell me, point out another example of that happening. So it just so happens in some of the Greek myths, some of the Greek stories of thought that Plato was conceived of by some spirit of God to his mother. The same was said about Alexander the Great, people wanting to make themselves big. So how can you hold to this truth when it comes to Jesus? The interesting thing is that despite the fact that said, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way, it never does describe exactly how the Holy Spirit acted, or what the Holy Spirit's role was. And that is a helpful thing. But one of the certain things is wherever Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Old Testament or in the New, it speaks about the very presence of God. That where the Spirit is, the presence of God is. So however you understand it, what we discover in this story is that here is Mary, and the Spirit of God has been present with her. And then we move on to speaking about the other part of this story. And Matthew's Gospel for the Bible says, it says, Now her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public grace, a.k.a. Came, planned to dismiss her, to divorce her quietly, secretly. Because according to the Old Testament, women that were caught outside of marriage having a child could be liable, like one story in the New Testament, to be brought out into the community. So, Joseph, being a righteous man, didn't want to stain Mary. So, According to this, Joseph acted as a righteous man. He moved forward to end the relationship with Mary. Now, how many of you have at one time and have heard the phrase, stand on the view? Anybody? Anybody have to say that to you? Stand on the view. Does it usually accompany the wagging of the finger so you can point that thing to be filled with shame. And what shame did it do? It cost the soul of the It cost the soul It cost the soul of the But perhaps it may split off of your lips at one time. It's great to spend some money to say that you need to spend some money to say that it's not a good thing. The concept of shame. Joseph sought to not put shame on it, but not as secret. In this relationship. So he was acting as a righteous man. So it says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, a righteous man. He 
the next verse changes the story a bit. But just when he had resolved to do this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, None of Joseph's son of David, but said, Joseph, son of David, Joseph, the king of the king, the great king of Israel, Joseph, the son of David, do not be afraid. Have you heard those words before? Do not be afraid of me. Do not be afraid of me. Do not be afraid every time people encounter the very presence of God. Begin with do not be afraid. Because I have to believe the first thing we experience in the very presence of God is a little bit of that. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It speaks about a special intervention that took place inside of Mary. Do not be afraid to take Mary. So in this time, the son of David acted acted in a way that enabled Joseph to follow the command of the angel of God. But he followed the angel. Perhaps there are names that have been spoken to you at some point in your life that still fit and resonate in some of you. Some of these kinds of words, words that fit in your life, Maybe they weren't spoken to you. Maybe they were spoken to a brother or a sister, a mother or a father, an uncle or an aunt. But I know these kinds of negative words. You are not to nothing. You are a failure. You know? All these kinds of tags that we put on people. But the interesting thing is that we believe that Jesus Christ has come to give us a new beginning. That's why Christmas becomes so special to us, because we celebrate God becoming one of us. God in our midst, and this Christ who, who is born in a very humble way, to a very humble family, in a small remote village, born in a stable outside of that village, whose first guests are smelly shepherds. This is the one who we regard as the son of David. This is the one, because Joseph adopts him, legally takes Jesus to be his son. And whether it's biological or legal, it doesn't matter. He is still the son of David. He is the king of the world. For God so loved the world. Because of this fact, and Jesus not ascending to a throne, but rather going to the cross, he takes what has been spoken about us and takes it to the cross with him because we are reminded that in Christ Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. He has claimed us as his own and given us a new identity as followers of Jesus. Because of this fact, all things become new. The things that have been said about us no longer need to be remembered or to offend us or hurt us as we press into the future. No matter what we've done or what we have said, a new creation means we belong new and fresh in Christ. And because of that, God starts over the So we continually Verse 21, it speaks of Mary. It says, He will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people. Jesus' vocation is the one of being the Savior. His name, Joshua in Hebrew, means the one who will save, the one who saves our life. We have been given this new life. And therefore, as a result of this, it says, and he will save you from your sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Forgive me. Give me new life. New beginnings. New identity is our friend. And because of this, John the Baptist goes on to say, as Jesus himself says, now you are to bear good fruit. This is our calling as followers of Jesus. 
we have been called in the name of Jesus Christ, claimed as His children, and therefore we are to live in love. We are to practice forgiveness. So I ask today, who is it that God is calling you to be prepared for Christmas to forgive? Perhaps it's to forgive yourself. The things that you have said or done, things in which you have been ashamed, but for which Christ forgives you. And as we receive the forgiveness of Christ Jesus, then surely we must take the act and ask for God's Holy Spirit to give us the strength to be able to forgive ourselves so that we can let go. That's the gift of forgiveness. It's letting go of the things that we've said and done and begin to lift fully into what it means to be a new creation in Christ Jesus that we were. So who is it that you must forgive? Maybe it's that family member who's the porcupine of your family, who is hard to approach, the one that's hard to wrap your arms around because there's just so much pain associated with them. Well, ask God to please show you the way to love the porcupine in your family. Or maybe it's your co-worker, the one who's the skunk, the one it's hard to get close to. Well, may God empower you to love them from a distance. But Jesus goes even further, doesn't he? Because Jesus' love is for the sake of the whole world. He's the one who calls us to even love our enemies. And that God requires of us. He wants to be as Holy Spirit. Please help me to love the one that I can't believe. Help me to love the one that I can't believe. You can change my life. And the interesting thing is that when God begins to change our hearts and our attitudes about somebody else, you know what? They notice the change in you. They notice the change in you. People can sense when you reject them, when you judge them, when you want to uh, react in silent anger towards them. People know. But when we ask God to allow us to forgive them, to love them. May God empower us. God empower us to be noted by the one that we can to love. Loving your enemies as God first loves us. And finally, to be right in this world. According to Isaiah, it says, Look, the young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him a man. God is is a promise of God that we celebrate. Not only was God with us in Christ on the earth, but Christ lives in the life. So God is with us in the There's some people who have been going through very hard times. Some who find themselves in a relationship that is coming undone. Or they've been dealing with personal and family health related issues. Or they're dealing with some economic shortcomings. And the words that I heard is, you know, if God was with me, this stuff surely wouldn't happen. And remind us, Jesus was born in the dead, he wasn't born in the dead. He was in the present, he got shepherd. Jesus was born for family that did not have much. And yet, this is the one who so blessed on the poor. This is the one who cared for the very poor of the community. He himself came from that very rich. So when we say, surely God is with me, otherwise my relationships would be working like I prayed for, or my finances would come into place, or my health related questions would be resolved. And I want to say to you that's not the case at all. But it's whether we are dealing with good times or hard times. The scriptures remind us when we are weak, when we are in need, God is surely with us if we will open our hearts. But it requires us the openness of our hearts to be open to who God is. It doesn't mean that God's going to lift us out of the mess that we find ourselves in or that God is necessarily going to heal the illness we've been battling with. But I want to assure you, you are not in it alone. Christ is with you in the midst of it. 
so that we can untie the knots that we can possibly untie, and those that we can't, we will just simply deal with. There's just no assurance but that for some reason we think here in this country that we should be free of any kind of medical or financial woes. Yet our brothers and sisters in the world, some of whom whose average length of life might be 45 years and who deal with health-related issues most of their life, continue to cling to them because they have nowhere else to turn. We have bought into this idea that God should be this sugar plum fairy that could make everything right for us, but that's not who God is. I want to share with you guys with us. No matter what we're facing, we can have a good And then the Lord is with us. So we walk by faith and not by faith, but we walk with the confidence that God is with us. And when Joseph awoke, he tells us, from his sleep, he did as he did for the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife. But had no marital relationship with her until she had born with him. Joseph's vocation, his purpose, was to take Mary to be the one to name and legally take Jesus to be his son and to name him his vocation of him, Joshua, the one who saved, the one who would save. And Mary's vocation was to say yes to the angel. Take this child into the room, no matter what names were spoken about her. Not making her life necessarily that easy, but she kept all these things we are reminded in this gospel and coming to me. It was tough, but it was a Friends, vocational extension God calls us to, to bear good fruit to those who need God's sense. Yes, we live in a troubled world. We live in a troubled community. We see people with a lot of heartaches and broken lives all around us. The season of Christmas, the holiday, we have to have one of the hardest parts of the whole family for some individuals. God sends us who have received the light of Christ into our lives to be the light of this world. A light for those that can be. As we practice forgiveness, and reminding people who are distant from God and distant from the church, God has not forgotten you. God wants you to know the love of Christ has for you, and that God wants to forgive you for whatever it is that's holding you back. God wants to forgive you for the mistakes you've made, the things that have occurred, the pain that you've experienced. God wants to bring forgiveness into your life. And how does God do those best things? We do that. We are to be a light in this world. As imperfect as we are, we still see the cross of our Christ Jesus. We come and forgive and do our best, and sometimes it comes back to us. We come to love, and sometimes it's not loving things that come off our lips, but we do the best that we can. God takes the best of us. That's better than good for us. And that's the impact of the world and all those around us. So we give thanks today. Pray this Christmas that you would find and know who well the love and forgiveness and grace that God has for you. And may God be to rely on the Holy Spirit to bear his life for those of us. That's how our world changes. That's how our world changes. One person at a time. So keep your eyes and ears open to the the people around you, the choice for people, the things that can destroy. People are pretty lonely, and some people are pretty depressed. And God sends you to demonstrate His love, to demonstrate His grace and His forgiveness in the new life that's in you. As you spend some time in the with yourself, your prayers, your prayers. God bless you.